We have some great guests here. We have uh, uh, a lot of people around the world, lots of people around the world looking in. I think about 60 people signed up for this already. So it's a real event. This is a kind of real landmark event for the media and communications team and indeed for Jim Lab and Sure as well in uh, Berlin. Um, it's really important because one of the things which I, as a, in my previous role as a journalist, always felt was that how do you know if UN development aid works? Who knows? How do you measure? Because we certainly know that the, the world is littered with white elephants, uh, which were you know, bright new things when they were invented in somebody's spreadsheet. But then, you know, after a considerable amount of money to invest them, somebody forgot about them and they were, were left in an embarrassing afterthought. And we don't really know if they made any difference or not. So I think what's really important is that you know, the market doesn't necessarily play a big role, doesn't play much of a role at all in the UN landscape. So it's hard to measure, hard to know if things had an outcome, positive outcome, or what happened. And I think what's really important about today's event is that really for the first time, certainly in my time in IOM, we are bringing you know, evaluation to the work we do. And as somebody said, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And I think what's super important about today is that we actually have you know, measured something. And you know, that measurement should, can come up with bad news as well as good news. I think fortunately in this case, the news is pretty good. You'll be hearing about that. So that to me is the most important thing. Um, and then secondly, the underlying campaign, which I'll just speak briefly about, is that, you know, the, again, the, the, the universe of communication from the UN is populated with you know, robes and scandals and snake oil salesmen and goodness knows what, beltway bandits. And a lot of money gets expended on campaigns that are never measured. Them. We have no idea if they work. We have no idea. From the famous, um, I won't name the country, but they certainly put up posters of uh, crocodiles eating migrants as they swam across oceans. We know that this sort of stuff doesn't work. But yet, we persist in seeing campaigns like this. And then, uh, somewhat as a shot across the bows, the, the Netherlands government produced a very interesting, if uh, slim volume, assessing awareness raising campaigns. And the, the, the reading, it's worth digging it out, you find it very easily. The reading was pretty grim. It basically said they don't work. At least they don't work as implemented, or as promised. So we thought that's kind of bad news for our for our uh, hopes and for the future of media and communications and IOM, where we, we know we need to help communicate and raise awareness, especially about the risks that migrants go through when they follow the dream that they see on Facebook or something like that, and follow the hands of the smugglers. So we went uh, to the Dutch government and said, thank you very much for your insightful report. Can we talk about it? And can we come back to you and maybe try out another way and try and show you that there is a way to do and where it's raising campaign in a way it works. And I think this coincided with the realization that thanks to uh, the social media revolution, we all know, <coughs> and it's been documented, I think, multiple times, <coughs> people in the room who will come hate me if I'm wrong, you know, that trust is dead in politics. Nobody believes our politician, nobody trusts our presidents, nobody trusts the police person, least of all, nobody trusts the spokesperson. So this is just the reality of the world of social media. We live in bubbles where we trust those we encounter in our social media bubble. Or for that matter, the bubble of our domestic heart. We trust our immediate family, our loved ones, our brothers or sisters. So we essentially thought that is the route to go if we're going to try another awareness raising campaign. We have to find a route of trust. And stop, please stop with this uh, key messages nonsense and how do we get populations to do what we want them to do. When I worked in Haiti for a while, I went, it was like every day it was a new message from poor, poor, displaced people. Don't beat your child, follow the rule of law, wear a condom, don't drink. So I mean, it's like going like this. And every time you turned on the UN or US or whoever sponsored radio station, it was you know, a plethora of key messages being bombarded with people, which of course everybody laughed at, because it was nothing to do with their actual real lives. So the attempt that we have here, and it's basically not rocket science, it's just really simple journalism at the end of the day, is talk to ordinary people, see what they say, and transmit it to the rest of the ordinary people. 
And if you're good at a job, you re-establish trust, you re-establish this uh, thread of trust in the population, and before you know it, you'll have a communication with some of the newspapers and things. So that was the whole idea. How can we get, how can we re-establish trust, and how can we help migrants who've been through the mill, who've been through potentially slavery and sexual abuse and others and what, especially in Libya, how can we get them to communicate with their families and say, hold on, it's not a good idea. And there were many who said, look, they're too embarrassed, they're not going to talk. They're broke, they're afraid to show their face. But I think you'll be hearing some interesting testimony from Hamid today about how that actually worked in practice. And something actually extraordinary seems to happen in that we gave them the liberty to speak, we gave them a platform, we gave them agency. And without, you know, I am doing anything but kind of guiding the process, this campaign took off. I'm not sure how many videos were produced, but I heard, I seem to recall, about a thousand videos. Okay, that's a thousand crowd-sourced videos. You can't do that. You said this is kind of, you know, the world champion of communications. I remember being with the head of communications saying, we can't make crowd-sourcing work. What's wrong? Help us do it. Well, because they're doing it the wrong way. But in this case, migrants in West Africa, three countries, Guinea, Guinea, Conakry, Senegal, and Nigeria produced a thousand videos. So many that wasn't having been edited, they're still there somewhere lingering in the background. They've been shared with their families. So that all by way of saying that the campaign I think has worked because it's using basic first principles of communication. We've been really generously supported by the Dutch government and Jan is here to speak in a few minutes. Uh, so much so that Thanks to this evaluation and thanks to the close work of the team in Dakar with the Dutch government that they expanded it to 14 countries. Now that's also unprecedented in my experience in, in Ireland, in the UN landscape. Difficult to get funding for communications is almost impossible. It's written into the budget plan and it's the first thing to be cut. So in this case, you know, I'll, I'll let others speak for the amounts, etc., but it's huge, it's being quintupled and more. Yeah, that's so I think that's a huge amount of confidence in, the, in those who have implemented the project, in the, in the approach we're taking, and above all, in the impact evaluation, which we're going to hear all about. So enough of me. I'd like now to introduce Francois Bien from the Mission of Senegal, who has stepped in at the last minute to represent his ambassador. We're very grateful really to you for doing that. I will try to just speak in French, in English, sorry, because I prepared myself to just speak in English because I don't English kind of events. So, so just, uh, just to, to present my ambassador of the Chinese, who are not able, who is not able to to be here with us to to conquest of uh, of calendar, and also to on on behalf of my ambassador to congratulate I am for for this event for the launch of this event, and to say the support of uh, of Senegalese authorities to uh, to Africa. As you as you may know. Um, Senegal has a, has a large diaspora in the world. That's why the, the issue of, uh, of migration is very, very important for us. And with, uh, with Iran, we have, uh, um, let's say, uh, an active cooperation that helps us to, to make many, many activities, such as the opening of the resource center of migrants in 2018, in uh, in Tambatunda, um, the ongoing uh, national migration policy document of Senegal, as well as the Migrant Profile in partnership with what we call in Senegal, I state, the Agence Nationale, the Agency for Statistics and uh, and Geography. So that's why we are very very glad to, to be here with you. And uh, concerning the, um, the, the study, the, 
yeah, precisely. We expect that the results will will lead us to, to push forward on the on the on the on the issue of migration, and it will certainly be a great contribution for for regular migration. In particular, to the food, the, the sharing of experiences to the to the migrants back at at their at their local communities. So, to finish, to conclude, my country, as you must know, is a great supporter for the global compact, global compact for safe and um, how to say safe. Uh, Self ordinary, <laughs> thank you, self ordinary and short migration. So that's why we hope uh, these, uh, these new uh, initiatives will will, uh, will help us to, to contribute to achieve the, the goal tree of the global compact. So I hope the discussion we will have after after the presentation of the of the survey will uh, will uh, will contribute to the to the success and I, I would like to take. So I'd like to introduce Jan Brunzena, who's a senior policy officer of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. He's been a great friend of this project uh, from its very inception with Sabine very Sabine somewhere here. Sabine very much helped uh, you know, in the background, discussions are super important between diplomats, and member states, and you know, getting the wheels turning on this took, took a while, and uh, I'm really grateful to you for, for all your support along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lennart, and uh, thanks to, um, uh, many thanks to the uh, Gym Deck for organizing uh, this uh, Event. Um, as you said, I'm a, the Netherlands is the daughter of, uh, of Microsoft Messengers. Um, not only Microsoft Messengers, there's a lot of other campaigns as well that we, uh, we finance. Um, together, that constitutes about 25% of our budget uh, for migration management. So that's quite a lot of, lot of money. Um, why is it that we put so much money in these campaigns? The reason especially is that we think that these campaigns, um, as we would like them to be, will have a preventive effect. Uh, and wherever you can prevent things in terms of suffering, but also in terms of, of costs for um, uh, asylum procedures and, and uh, return and reintegration, uh, this is what we should do. Um, the question, of course, remains always: um, Does it work? And um, we have very, very little to, to go. Especially, what we did have this report, uh, but as you said, it was not a very uh, give a very positive picture about uh, what we had done so far. Um, so, what we meant to do by um, uh, migrants and messengers is to go to a second generation project. And um, I um, thank uh, you and Amy and also Frank very much for um, brainstorming with us and making this something uh, that uh, has turned out to be quite uh, successful as, as we see it. Um, one element that we think is, is, is really did better than we expected is um, the, the fact that the journeys actually started to own the project themselves and started to to um, be uh, play a decisive role in the design of the project. Um, but as to the effects that we um, set out to achieve, um, for example, reduce or manage, better manage irregular migration, prevent suffering, um, promote awareness, uh, there we didn't really know whether it worked. Um, and actually evaluation in a robust way wasn't even part of the uh, of the design of the project uh, in the beginning. Um, so uh, we needed a, a positive coincidence to uh, to get there, and uh, that was when I met Jasper. He told us about uh, what the UK did, what DFID uh, did in, uh, for evaluation of uh, of the web raising campaigns, and so we found out that actually um, Microsoft's message was a perfect candidate for that kind of 
evaluation, and this is how it got um, started. Um, now we have this uh, report on the table. That's that's great. Uh, it has taken time, but I think it's, uh, the result is great. Um, I hope we have uh, we'll have a good discussion today, and I would just like to make a couple of remarks uh, about the, the, the discussion, uh, the points that we could keep in mind and, and discuss uh, this morning. As far as we're concerned, evaluation, uh, robust evaluation, should be part of all campaigns of a certain size. The thing is that they are very expensive. If we look at the uh, migrants and messengers second phase that we will do, um, hopefully very soon, uh, we can see that we have, Jasper will tell you more about this today, uh, evaluation is part of that, but it's 17% it's of the budget. It's very expensive. Um, and not everybody maybe is, is prepared to, to finance that kind of thing. <coughs> Uh, so one of the things I would like to know um, from the discussion, how can we make sure that, that we can do evaluation, but in maybe a less expensive way, even if we want it to be robust. Then, um, because it's so expensive, what we would like uh, is to, when we get the results, that these results are applicable quite broadly across the field. Um, but what we see at the same time, and, and also in this evaluation, is that it's very contextualized. This evaluation is about the car, it's about, um, it's about urban uh, migrants. Um, it's about one country and one sort of culture of, of migration. So can, how can we um, apply this to other contexts? I think this is what uh, you, the experts call external validity, and I would like to maybe to know more about how we can try and, and have an external validity that is as, as big as possible, so that each evaluation is as useful as possible. Then, um, finally, the last thing I, I would like to, to say is, as a recommendation to this, um, to this, this meeting, this seminar, is that we should like we should try to stay uh, open-minded and, and objective, as uh, Leonard said, uh, very rightly. Um, we want to know what works and what doesn't work. And if something doesn't work, then we shouldn't do it. Um, so we should not go into this, um, this meeting and, and not into any evaluation with the question in mind, um, let's try to prove that what we are doing actually works. It's very easy to be skeptical, and that's what people often tell me, and even in my own ministry, um, on anecdotal evidence, not real evidence. What I always tell them is that um, uh, we have no proof, actually, that it works, but we have no proof either that it doesn't work. So let's, let's, try, let's try to do these evaluations and try to, uh, to use them to learn uh, and, and get better in what we do. So that's <clears throat> what I hope we can do today. And uh, I want to thank you for being here and for attending remotely, and I wish you a very useful seminar. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jan. Now, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Gervais Appelt, who's an international migration specialist and well known cloud and has worked with Ireland for decades. <laughs> and we're delighted to be back amongst us. Please, sir. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Uh, before I was at IOM, long, long time ago, I was a public servant. In fact, uh, I guess my professional life has been divided equally between being a public servant and uh, being uh, an IOM official. And uh, very early in my public service career, I learned that it is a challenge, an enormous challenge, for a government official to be seen as being authoritative when he or she gives advice. One of my first jobs at the Department of Immigration in Sydney was standing at the reception to basically tell people what they had to do, where they had to go, and to answer their uh, queries. And one day I was standing at the reception desk, just pretty much like this one, 
and a lady came up with her daughter. And she said that she wanted to apply for an Australian passport. Well, the Department of Immigration did not issue Australian passports. That was the prerogative of the Department of Foreign Affairs, which was across the floor, on the same level, but across the floor, at the other end of the building. So I said, ma'am, uh, let me help you out. Uh, we do not provide passports here, but you see, if you just go along the corridor, there at the other end, you can apply for a passport. And she became rather unsettled. And she said no, she was absolutely sure she had uh, sought information and she had been assured that it was the Department of Immigration that provided the passport. So we argued it out for a few minutes, but I could not convince her. Until finally she turned to her daughter and then spoke not in English but in Mauritian Creole. And she turned to her daughter and said, this bonehead is absolutely clueless, <laughs> stupid man. <laughs> and she tore off in her half. So quickly I didn't have the time to say, I might have perfectly understood what you said. <laughs> <laughs> but that left me with an enduring uh, lesson. That when a public servant speaks, he or she is not necessarily going to be a follower, to be respected. This is the challenge that we face in the field of immigration and in other fields as well. But you see, the problem today has become much more complicated than it used to be. The world was at one time a fairly simple place where there were, in fact, authority figures who could be relied upon. I grew up in a small town where we knew who the authority figures were. And if someone had a life problem, they knew they could turn. There was a hierarchy of officials. They could turn uh, to the teacher. They could turn to the priest or pastor. They could turn to the policeman. They could turn to the postman, and so on. And these people were supposed to give reliable and credible advice. But we live in a world where the pyramid of credibility has been turned upside down. The authority figures are no longer trusted. And the ones who are trusted are the ones who used to be the base of the pyramid, namely friends, relatives, acquaintances. <coughs> so now they are the ones who provide supposedly reliable advice. They are the ones who are listened to and they are the ones who are trusted. And so to me the first attractive feature of this uh, initiative is that it comes to grips with that. With the fact that in this world, if we are going to give advice that is likely to be listened to, then we must change our approach. We can no longer, as government officials or as IOM officials, talk down to people and tell them, this is what you should do. Do you want to migrate? They can we understand that, but do not migrate in this way. And even if we're giving them perfectly accurate information and tell them about the dangers they might encounter on the way and the risks that may be taken, they are unlikely to listen to us. So what we've got to do is find smart ways of communicating that information but through people, interlocutors, who will be trusted. To me, that's one very attractive feature of this project. And the second attractive feature of this project is that it gives us some very hard to get data. You know, data, strangely enough, is a rare commodity in the field of migration. Very odd. Uh, just to make you think a little bit about that, imagine that today we were not talking about migration, but we are talking about the environment. Now, if we were talking about the environment, we would have so much data at our fingertips. We'd be able to say today how much carbon dioxide there is in Geneva. 
to 0.0001%. Or we could say what particles there are in the air. Or we could say what the temperature of Lake Geneva is and whether it's got warmer by 0.5 of a percent over the last 100 years. Not so in the field of migration. And when decision makers want to take decisions, they grope around for data and they can't find it. Which is why it is so important to have projects like this one where we are then able to harvest data and to tell them we have run this project and then we have surveyed the people, we have assessed the outcomes and we can tell you that this information campaign has had that impact on people. That is precious information. And so, to me, uh, I wasn't called here. Uh, to, to promote this project, but rather to provide comment as an observer. But to me, these are the two really valuable features of this project. Two rare commodities, communication strategies and uh, data. And to me, this is the kind of in initiative that allows us to move forward. Policymakers all over the world are trying to grapple with this conundrum. We know we are in a mobile world. There's nothing we can do to stop it. It's much, much, much too late. I could spend hours here telling you of the mistakes we did. But we've done them, and the world is now a mobile world. Our challenge now, then, is to allow people to be sensible in their decisions on mobility and to be wise and to do so in ways that won't hurt themselves and, and won't hurt the community. <laughs> this project to me is a project that deserves very much to, to continue, a project which will help us in a very tangible way to understand better why people move and to help them to do so while protecting themselves and protecting others. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gervais. So we can now turn to the business end of the morning event. I'll turn it over to Amy and I think Mohammedou as well shortly afterwards. Thank you.